Good day all, my name is Oscar Englund. Uh, I'm Associate Professor in Spatial Analysis at the Mid-Sweden University in Östersund, Sweden. And uh, I was asked to present today, I was asked by Joran Bandes uh, at Stalmers University, close colleagues since many years to present what has been a major, a major research focus of us for, for quite some time now, uh, namely what we call beneficial land use change. And uh, this is uh, the, the, the research I'm presenting here today is its contribution to IA Bioenergy Task 45. And uh, it's titled Expanded Use of Perennial Crops for Bioenergy Can Reduce Land Use Impacts in Europe. So beneficial land use change is, uh, is the land use change that is involved when the introduction of new biomass production systems improve ecosystem services and or conditions for biodiversity. And of course, ben, this, this can entail many different things. And what we're going to talk about today in specific is uh, what we call strategic penalization. This is when suitable perennial production systems are strategically introduced in agricultural landscapes to provide specific environmental benefits. Uh, to give a few examples of what this may look like, uh, to, to the bottom here, bottom left uh, image, we see um, uh, wind, windbreaks. And windbreaks are established in, in landscapes that are subject to wind erosion. Uh, and they protect the cropland in between the windbreaks uh, from, from wind erosion. Uh, and in addition to, to increasing yields and protecting the soil, um, uh, these windbreaks can also can also function as green infrastructure in the landscape, meaning to improve the conditions for biodiversity, and they can also uh, increase soil organic carbon uh, and under specific uh, conditions also uh, mitigate uh, emissions to to of, of agrochemicals to water courses, uh, and these windbreaks can be they can be designed using using fast growing tree species such as willow or poplar, and then they can also be uh, continuously harvested for biomass. Another example is what we see to the right here in the right top uh, uh, figure or photo. We see uh, an agricultural field adjacent uh, uh, to a watercourse. And this uh, uh, entails a risk of uh, um, uh, runoff of uh, nutrients and agrochemicals into the watercourse. And to uh, mitigate this, uh, they have in this case established some sort of natural buffer with, with grass. Um, but if we take a look at the bottom right corner, it's the same location here, this so-called so semi-natural buffer has been replaced with a managed buffer with uh, short rotation coppice willow and some sort of energy grass here. And they can do the same, they can have the same effect when it comes to, um, when it comes to stopping and nutrients and agrochemicals from entering the water course uh, can even have a, a better such effect. And, but at the same time, they can be harvested for, for biomass. A third example is to introduce um, more uh, or introduce grass production into crop rotations. And by doing so, uh, there is a, a good uh, potential for increasing soil organic carbon, uh, but it can also be positive when it comes to uh, erosion issues uh, as well as to increase or enhance conditions for, for biodiversity. So these are three concrete examples of what strategic penalization could be. And uh, by implementing these types of, of systems, we, uh, the land use change is indeed beneficial. Um, here are two articles that we, have, that we have recently published on the subject. I'm going to talk now a bit more about the first one is titled Beneficial Land Use Change. Strategic expansion of new biomass plantations can reduce environmental impacts from EU agriculture. And in this study, we, we explored options and potentials for strategic penalization in Europe uh, at a rather general level. Um, but we took a look, we modeled uh, over 81,000 individual sub watersheds or landscapes, as we also call them. And for each such landscape, we map and quantify 
the degree of the of current environmental impacts, including soil by water erosion or wind erosion, nitrogen emissions to water, recurring floods, accumulated losses of soil organic carbon. Um, and then we also combine this information with the land use data uh, to indicate how effective it could be to strategically to use strategic penalization when it comes to mitigating these impacts. So we take a look at some of the results. Here we look at erosion, and this is soil loss by water and wind erosion combined. And to the left, we see the degree of the current impact. And to the right, we see um, how effective it could be to use strategic penalization for mitigating this impact. And soil loss by erosion is mainly a problem in Southern and Southeastern Europe, most notably in Italy. And when it comes to the effectiveness, we see that some new areas open up where, where strategic penalization can actually be effective in mitigating erosion, even though erosion is not that big a problem. And that is because of the of a very large dominance of annual crops into the in the agricultural landscape. Um, Nitrogen emissions to water is, is very uh, notably concentrated to Northwestern Europe uh, at also parts of Central Europe. But again, when we try to estimate the mitigation effectiveness of strategic penalization, we see that some new areas open up where strategic penalization could be effective, such as um, in Poland or, or, or large parts of France. We will also see uh, an, an opposite effect. Uh, in Ireland, the mitigation effectiveness is rather limited, while the impact is, is uh, substantial. And that is a combination of, uh, of two things. First, that the agricultural um, landscape in, in Ireland is already, to a large degree, dominated by uh, perennial crops. Uh, so the effect of introducing additional perennial crops is, is of course limited. And the other is, uh, which also explains the, the large impact, is a, a greater contribution of atmospheric deposition, meaning it's more difficult to, to mitigate these impacts. Um, recurring floods is problematic along um, all major rivers across Europe. Um, uh, when we take a look at the effectiveness, we see largely the same picture. Um, it's we have a very high or higher, very high effectiveness uh, along all major rivers in Europe, where we also have uh, a large um, uh, or high density of annual crops. Uh, most notably, perhaps in the Po Valley in, in Italy and along large parts of the Danube Basin or in the Danube region. And finally, accumulated losses of soil organic carbon. Um, the results indicate that this is a high or very high in, in, in uh, the majority of, of Europe. So it's a widespread uh, impact. And uh, we see pretty much the same picture when we look at how effective it could be to use strategic penalization for, for mitigating this impact. And that is because we have a very strong spatial correlation between uh, annual crop production and accumulated losses of soil organic carbon, which is also well known. So um, after we published these uh, results, we, um, we, uh, we noted that it provides new and interesting information on the effectiveness of, of unspecified perennial production systems for strategic perennialization, but we were interested in where and how specific perennial production systems could, could be used for this purpose. And also, how can the benefits be quantified? Because that is really critical. Um, this required massive updates to, to the modeling framework, uh, which we have worked with now for, for, quite, for, for, for quite some time. And we are, uh, we are preparing two articles now for, for um, to, to show um, results for specific types of production systems. In one paper, which is currently under review, we look at riparian buffers and windbreaks 
And a second paper is dedicated to in rotation grass production. And in both these papers, we use different scenarios for large scale deployment across Europe. And we model what, these, um, what the effects um, could be when it comes to the environmental benefits, but also uh, for each landscape, we could quantify areas of the different production systems and the biomass output from the, from the, from the new production systems. And as for the previous paper, we're covering over 81,000 landscapes across Europe. Um, I'm going to give you just a few examples of, of what we, uh, what the, our new modeling framework can, can do and what we show in, in the articles. Um, here we see a, a figure showing basically how large share of the maximum area of a specific type of riparian buffer that is needed to achieve a low degree of, of uh, nitrogen emissions to water in each individual landscape. And um, if, we, if we take a look at the colors, the gray colors indicate that the impact is, or the effectiveness, the estimated effectiveness of strategic penalization is so low, so that it's not uh, considered, riparian buffers are not considered an option. Then we have the black colors. Here, uh, repair and buffers are considered as uh, an option, but the impact is so low so that uh, no buffers are really necessary to get the impact down to this low degree, this acceptable level. And then it increases in the dark purple areas, we need zero to 10% of the total maximum buffer area. Um, uh, but in, in other parts, such as the southwestern parts of UK, in many landscapes, this type of a narrow buffer is insufficient for getting the impact down to uh, this acceptable low level. And so there is, uh, and in, in those cases, of course, we need uh, other uh, designs of repair and buffers, typically wider buffers. So what um, what we can see then is that it's a very large variation in when it comes to the implementation potential and uh, <coughs> uh, of riparian buffers in Europe. And this is facilitated by our modeling framework, which is based, which is based on high resolution data. Another example here from the second paper where we look at in rotation grass production, we um, this is this in this in this um, article. We also use multiple options for for in rotation grass production and also different deployment scenarios. And similarly, as in in the last example, we see um, uh, a great variation across Europe. Um, in these um, these are two types of um, of uh, or basically two options for introducing uh, grass into crop rotations. Uh, two years of grass and four years of annual crops. And in this case, it's four years of grass and four years of annual crops. And uh, the colors indicate the increase in soil organic carbon by 2080 relative uh, a business as usual scenario without uh, in rotation grass production. And we see that um, in some areas, such as uh, large parts of, of Spain, we see a rather low soil organic carbon increase relative to the business as usual scenario. And in, in, in Eastern Europe, we see um, rather large soil organic carbon, relatively larger soil organic carbon increases. We also see a lot big or a notable difference between the two options here of uh, two years of lay and, and four years. So these are just two examples uh, showing um, uh, the results from the upcoming papers. But at this point, we can conclude that, uh, and we also show that beneficial land use change can indeed mitigate current environmental impacts while producing biomass for the bioeconomy. Uh, we also show that by riparian buffers and windbreaks can effectively reduce nitrogen emissions to water and soilless by wind erosion while providing substantial environmental co-benefits. And they can do so using a very limited amount of land at the European scale. 
Um, when it comes to introducing grass into crop rotation, we can expect uh, substantial soil organic carbon increases and also multiple co environmental co-benefits. And finally, to, uh, to use, to provide useful information for, for spatial planning and regional and local implementation of these types of, of uh, beneficial, uh, land, of these types of strategic penalization, um, we require higher resolution modeling. We need to go into the landscape and, and model uh, the implementation and the environmental effects uh, at, um, uh, at the landscape scale. As this will be a major focus for our uh, upcoming research after these papers. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening uh, and uh, the contact information for Joran and myself uh, is, is available here. Uh, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ivan Beda. Welcome to my presentation. I'm a junior researcher at Utrecht University and the title of my presentation is Supply Potential and Greenhouse Gas Footprint of Lignocellulosic Energy Crops and Advanced Biofuels. We carry out a spatial explicit assessment under the sustainability criteria of the Renewable Energy Directive Recast Re2, and we also took into consideration marginal lands. Rikov Nagels, Martin Uninger, and Florvard Hills are also part of this assessment. So, uh, the EU has set very ambitious uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets to try to mitigate the impacts from climate change. So, actually, becoming climate neutral by 2050 will mean that we will have to deploy various renewable energy sources. It means that, for example, we have to reduce 4,000 megatons of CO2 equivalents per year in order to try to meet this objective. And despite that, for example, biomass has been constantly debating the last year, the role of biomass will be considerably important in some sectors that are difficult to decarbonize, such as the heavy transport or the aviation sector. And why is the Renewable Energy Direct is so relevant uh, in, this, in this landscape of reducing emissions? It's because the Renewable Energy Directive has actually established targets of renewable energy consumption in the European Union. So what does these targets mean from the transport sector? It means that uh, by 2030, 14% of the energy consumed in this uh, sector must be renewable. Right now we stand at 9%, so, so we're still uh, a bit lagging behind there. It also has a subsection, uh, sorry, a, a sub a sub target of 3.5% of advanced biofuels and, bas and and biogas. Well, approximately today we stand at 0.4%. So so we're also behind there, and it also includes a cap of 70% of biofuels that can be produced from food and base crops. So only 7% of conventional food and face crops can be produced by 2030. However, we already stand at 9%, so, so this has to be reduced. In addition to that, it includes a uh, greenhouse gas emission savings criteria that actually says that all biofuels should demonstrate at least 65% greenhouse gas emission savings in comparison to their fossil uh, reference. So why is it no energy crops? Well, RED2 is also uh, promoting the use of different uh, biomass sources, and one of those is lignocellulosic energy crops. And then you will ask yourself why lignocellulosic energy crops are so important for the, for the climate targets. And first of all, they have the characteristic that they avoid competition with other land-based land services. So, so it already, for example, leaves aside the food versus fuel debate. They also have lower crop requirements than the food-based uh, energy crops, so they actually can deliver higher yields in less suitable conditions. And also when you consider then uh, the land competition with other land-based serves in marginal conditions, there's probably a lower risk because you cannot do much things with the marginal conditions that these areas are, so actually putting them into a use for living so energy crop could be a good alternative. In addition, Lignocellulosic energy crops production in marginal lands has been suggested that it will contribute to carbon sequestration, will help to restore the land, and will de derive in other uh, positive environmental impacts such as reduced soil erosion or, or enhanced rural development. Therefore, actually utilizing marginal lands seems like a very good strategy to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and enhance uh, and, and reduce negative environmental impacts. So therefore, we want to 
uh, this comes to, to, to our two objectives of, of, our, of our research was to try to assess the future potential of woody and herbaceous energy crops that are grown on marginal lands on the Red 2 sustainability criteria in Europe. That's our first objective. And then we want to assess what is the greenhouse gas footprints of different advanced biofuels that are produced from the crops that are, that are produced from these marginal lands. And we come to a three-step approach, actually, um, that is composed of, of, of three steps, as, as it suggests. So first, we actually determine what is the available land that is actually marginal and meets its two sustainability criteria. We do this for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Then once we have established this land availability, we estimate what is the biomass potential of different linear zoologic crops on these specific locations for 2030, 2040, and 2050. And then we actually estimate what is the greenhouse gas uh, performance of different advanced biofuels from the bio from the lithoxylosic energy crops that are produced in these locations. And I will explain a bit more into depth uh, this approach. So this is the, the, the approach we come with. So to establish the line availability, we use uh, the Louisa land cover projections for 2030, 2040, 2050. We overlay this data with the marginal land uh, polygons from MAGIC. MAGIC is the project that is currently working on, on determining this marginal land. And on top of that, we exclude all the land that 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 is not uh, that is not a uh, that it's not a uh, possible to be used in order to produce lignocellulosic energy crops in accordance to Red Two. And that's our, like our first approach. And with that, we determine line availability for 2030, 2040, and 2050. Then we consider what are the climatic conditions of these areas, what are the crop characteristics, and what is the suitability of these crops to, to, to each of these uh, biophysical characteristics. And we establish the biomass potentials for these, uh, for these three points in time. And we do this for eight different crops. I, I will explain this a bit more into depth in a, in a moment. And then after establishing this biomass potential, we decided to, to complete the supply chains into six different advanced biofuel uh, supply chains. And this is only done for 2030. It's because we limit our scope of advanced fuel production to 2030 because if we actually extend our scope beyond that, then we will require to include uh, technological improvements, which actually falls outside of the scope of the study. So the crops we selected are uh, five herbaceous ligand solar energy crops and, and three short rotation copies, which are suggested to be the most relevant for, for Europe. And then we, we selected six advanced uh, biofuels that are actually close to commercialization or are already commercialized. That's, that's the criteria we got. And here you can see what is, the, what is the conversion technology and what are the steps in the supply chain. So this is just an example to show you how we actually translated red two criteria into spatial parameters. So what we did was tracking down what was all the sustainability criteria in the red two and how we could translate it into 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 spatial parameters. So for example, we tracked down protected areas. We tracked down, for example, high biodiversity grasslands, and we did this for all the directive. And then this is how it looks when you exclude one type of land that cannot be used in accordance with the red two criteria. This is the example of protected areas. And we did the same separately from the red tube. We did the same by taking into account marginal land. So this is how marginal land looks in Europe according to biophysical characteristics as established in MAGIC. Once we did that, we proceed to estimate the biomass potentials and we did a three-step approach which is it's actually composed of gross biomass potential. So basically the maximum amount of biomass that you can produce annually given uh, the water use eff efficiency of each crop in relation to how much water is lost from evapotranspiration. Then we include agroecological agro suitability maps to include the effects of biophysical characteristics. And in order to project this into the future, we include the IPCC RC RCP 4.5 projections in temperature, precipitation, false free days, and these characteristics in order to have a more accurate estimation of these yields for 2030, 2040, and 2050. And after we have already done these steps, then we included the crop-specific harvest indexes uh, to estimate how much biomass is actually can be potentially harvested depending on each crop characteristics. And I want to start with the results of the biomass potential. So this is how much biomass can be actually produced from each crop for each point in time on marginal lands that meet 
red to sustainability criteria and we also have a one bar as you can see that it's uh, the maximum yield so what we did was uh, selecting for each location uh, for each available location the crop with the highest yield and then we add it up for all the European for all Europe and that's how we got to this biomass potential which is approximately it goes from below 1400 petajoules years in 2030 to up to almost 1600 petajoules year in, in 2050 and the difference in biomass potential between crops is mainly ad attributed to the ad adaptability of each crop to, the bio to different biophysical conditions. So, for example, red canary grass, as you can see, has a high biomass potential, but also delivers low lower yields than most of the crops. And it has a high biomass potential. It's because its adaptability makes it suitable for a range for a big range uh, of conditions around Europe. So you can actually produce red canary grass in some locations which cannot produce another crop. And uh, the changes over time in this biomass potential are mainly determined by the land use dynamics, which is, comes from the Louisa model, um, and also the climate variations. So mainly temperature and precipitation dictate the extent to which crop is constrained to grow on a specific locations. So if precipitation changes up to 2040, that can be that it's beneficial for some crops. And this is how it looks spatially explicit. So on the left side, you can see the yield on energy terms. And on the right side, you can see what crop was selected for that location. Again, we have these maps for each crop and for each point in time. However, we, we selected to show only the max yield given the time constraint. And then you can see, for example, that the lowest biomass yields are located uh, in Scandinavia, while the highest ones are located in Spain or Greece. And this is because of the different biophysical conditions that are on each location and how the and, and how the crops adapted to that. So for example, in Scandinavia, actually the crop that has the highest yield is Miscanthus. In other locations, so for example, the south of Spain or Greece is Eucalyptus. So this is how is what's selected. And this is for 2030. Then we proceed to estimate the greenhouse gas performance of these advanced fuels for these locations from these crops that are produced in these areas. So as you can see, we have a very spatially explicit approach for the land use change part, but for the other steps in the supply chain, we actually uh, did standard values that are retrieved from literature. And this is the results. So you can see here uh, the greenhouse gas performance of the six different advanced fuels for every crop that is actually that that can be converted to each to each fuel so you see that not all crops are suitable for each fuel and it's because for some fuels you will need an extra step of pre-processing that we didn't include so already the, the the crop and the conversion part is already limited by the type of crop you select but anyway you can see here uh, the results for 2030 and the yellow squares are the total emissions while the 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 circle ones uh the circle ones are the land use change emissions and the ranges is the different in spatial variability of greenhouse gas emissions because of the difference in biophysical conditions and you can also see that also for a lot of the a lot of the type of crops for a specific uh, for a specific conversion route it wouldn't meet with a 65% greenhouse gas emission targets and then you can see that the that the routes that are doing the best are the conversion systems that are self sufficient like for example that produce methanol or DMD or diesel However, the total greenhouse gas emissions are still mainly driven by uh, land use change uh, emissions and by the amount of inputs related to N2O field emissions. We also did the same uh, as we did in biomass for the max yield. However, here we consider the lowest uh, greenhouse gas emission. So we actually selected for each, lo each location what was the conversion route with the lowest performance. And then we added up all, all together to see how much advanced biofuel could be produced in Europe with the lowest performance. And here, first, you're going to see how it looks spatially explicit. So on the left side, you see how, what are the emissions in grams of CO2 per megajoule of fuel. And on the right side, you see what is the conversion route. This is again for 2030. Um, and then you can see, for example, on the south, you have uh, very good conditions for eucalyptus. And then you actually made a uh, diesel. But then on the north, for example, in the Scandinavian parts, the, the, the best uh, conversion route was Viscantus to ethanol. But still, even though it was the lowest performance, you can still see that it not, doesn't meet uh, the 65% the greenhouse gas emission safety criteria from RED2. So uh, this is very... This is very um, this is very uh, spatial variable, as you can see, and then it depends a lot of what crop and one conversion route uh, is taken. 
so now what I was saying how much uh, advanced biofuel you can produce then you can see that uh, actually in total 376 petajoules per year can be produced when selecting for each location the best greenhouse gas performance and quite of that can actually be produced with negative emissions but still 46 uh, petajoules years will be uh, will not be able to be rolled into the market because despite being produced on marginal locations that actually comply with red to sustainability criteria they're not able to meet greenhouse gas emissions criteria and some discussion points of uh, what I was just saying about uh, about uh, that you will still have locations will you still meet all red to sustainability criteria but not greenhouse gas emissions criteria and what does this potentials mean in terms of, of targets? So actually it means that 3.1% of, of the final energy consumption can come from advanced biofuels uh, producing marginal lands. So this will support a 14% uh, minimum share that red to establish. And it can also uh, it can also help considerably the sub-target the sub target of 3.5% of, of advanced fuels that have to be produced by 2030. However, uh, these potentials can increase up to to 3.7 to 6.2 percent depending on the final use so actually we need a jointly effort between different alternatives to meet future renewable energy uh, targets some other discussion points is well we didn't consider uh, economic and uneconomic barriers such as competition with other domestic and imported biomass which will probably reduce this 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 this, this biomass and advanced biofuel potentials we also are uh, assessing very remote areas and actually it can be costly and inefficient to, to mobilize biomass from these areas, which will all probably also reduce the biomass and advanced biofuels potentials. We didn't consider other impacts such as biodiversity and water, which, which actually could be detrimental for these for this, for this supply chains. And we didn't consider costs and normally the, relative, the cost of feedstock in the locations are, are, are very high so it, it will also reduce it and some conclusion points well uh, the production of advanced biofuels from marginal lands can rise as a valuable EU climate change mitigation strategy to reduce CO2 emissions and support uh, to meet uh, biofuel demand in the future so with smart choices on location crop chain and supply chain are of paramount importance to release the maximum benefits of, of, of such strategy and always the special iterative in biophysical conditions need to be accounted uh, when assessing the climate effects of our energy system because as we have shown the omission of such characteristics can lead to inadequate assessments and, and consequently defect our policy recommendations. Thank you for your help and if you have any questions just contact me. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to technical session 22 of our conference. Uh, my name is Heitor Cantarella from the Agronomic Institute of Campinas and today I will talk about the contribution of sugarcane fertilization and byproduct management to greenhouse gas emissions in the context of uh, renewable bio. I'd like uh, first to acknowledge the contribution of my uh, colleagues from the Agronomic Institute of Campinas and also from the Brazilian Biorenewables National Laboratory. Uh, we'll cover uh, rapidly uh, Renova Bio, uh, reasons to uh, conduct this study, the procedures that we use, main results, and concluding uh, remarks. Renova Bio or Renova Bio is a legislation that was passed in the Brazilian Congress in 2017. It was implemented uh, later uh, last year to stimulate the production of uh, bioenergy, clean bioenergy in Brazil. Uh, this is uh, in accordance with the uh, commitments of Brazil uh, with the Paris Agreement uh, to decrease greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, one interesting uh, thing about the uh, Renova Bio is the issue of uh, decarbonization certificates for uh, bioenergy producers uh, that uh, produce clean bioenergy. Uh, this uh, decarbonization uh, certificates or CBIOS are equivalent to one ton of avoided CO2 equivalent emission. Uh, to uh, earn the CBIOS, the uh, producers, uh, the energy producer uh, must approve, have uh, their data proven and audited by independent uh, certifiers. And the Ceballos uh, have no fixed price. They are traded in the Sao Paulo Stock Exchange, and the current price is uh, approximately 10 US dollars per, per Ceballos. Why uh, we did this study? Well, 
nitrogen fertilizers that are responsible for 30 to 50 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions to produce uh, ethanol. And these uh, emissions come from the fertilizer manufacturer, which we have no control of, and uh, from the use of this fertilizer in the field where the main greenhouse gas emitted is nitrous oxide. Therefore, reducing the impact of any fertilizers in uh, bioenergy production is a relevant strategy to decrease greenhouse gas emission. Uh, Renova Bio uh, uses IPCC default value for the nitrous oxide uh, emission uh, factor, uh, uh, what we call uh, tier one. However, uh, there are uh, several recent studies in Brazil that uh, has generated local nitrous oxide uh, emission factor for fertilizers and also for some byproducts. And also there's data available on mitigation options, uh, especially the use of nitrification inhibitors and fertilizer and DNS uh, management. Therefore, the objective of uh, this study was to evaluate the impacts of local uh, emission factor data and of uh, nitrous oxide mitigation options uh, on greenhouse gas emissions of a biorefinery in their economic consequences. What we've done. First, we collected data from the literature recent studies conducted in Brazil, uh, encompassing 65 uh, field observations, and we calculate local nitrous oxide uh, emission factor for any fertilizer residues, and also uh, uh, the impact of uh, the use of nitrification in inhibitors and in, uh, fertilizing and VNAS uh, management over the nitrous oxide emission. Then we run a uh, cradle to gate life cycle analysis of an ethanol plant using four scenarios. And for that, we use the virtual sugarcane biorefinery uh, framework. And we simulated the operation of uh, autonomous uh, ethanol plant uh, using 50,000 hectares of land and producing three, uh, 339 million liters of uh, in anhydrous et ethanol. Then we calculate the greenhouse gas emissions uh, for this uh, ethanol plant, the avoided emissions and the CBIOS generated for the four scenarios. The four scenarios as, are as follows. Uh, scenario one is the uh, default value using the default IPCC value for nitrous oxide emission and uh, current sugar uh, meal uh, practice. Scenario two, uh, we replace the IPCC default value by uh, regional nitrous oxide emission factor uh, obtained uh, under Brazilian conditions and also the current sugar meal practices. Scenario three, uh, is equal to scenario two plus the use of nitrification inhibitors to decrease greenhouse uh, gases, especially nitrous oxide. And in scenario two, we use uh, the uh, VNAS and fertilizer management uh, techniques also to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. So those are the four scenarios that we study. Uh, the parameters for the life cycle analysis calculation is uh, the distillery crushing 4 million tons of sugarcane per year uh, in an area of uh, 50,000 uh, hectares and producing 339 million liters of anhydrous ethanol per year. So uh, this is a summary uh, of uh, the literature uh, survey that we did with Brazilian data. Uh, the IPC default value is 1%. Uh, um, this means that uh, for 1% uh, of the nitrous, nitrogen fertilizer that are applied in the field goes off as nitrous oxide. When you use the average data of all our, all our survey, 65 uh, independent uh, observations, uh, the, the emission factor goes down to 0.72%. Uh, when we use only the any fertilizer in Bertum, which is the main uh, uh, way uh, fertilizers are applied in sugarcane, uh, the emission factors goes to 0.60%. Uh, when we added nitrification inhibitors, uh, the emission factors go uh, down uh, sharply to uh, 
30. Uh, however, when we use VNAS plus fertilizer, the average uh, emission factor is even higher than IPCC uh, default value. However, when uh, we use uh, adequate management uh, practices in the field, separating the, the application of VNAS and fertilizer, the number goes down uh, to 0.34%. Uh, therefore, uh, all these numbers uh, show that there is a much lower uh, emission factor when we use local data uh, than when we use the IPCC default value. And here are the consequences in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission for uh, the whole plant. Uh, we, here we are uh, comparing uh, uh, scenario one and scenario two or tier one and tier two for two different uh, fertilizers. And we can see that uh, there's difference in emission uh, depending on the fertilizer. But most importantly, uh, when you use uh, tier two or the local data, the uh, amount of uh, uh, CO2 uh, emitted, CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas emitted uh, goes down sharply compared to tier one. Uh, and here is in this blue zone, uh, I'm showing the uh, contribution of the uh, nitrogen fertilizers to the overall greenhouse gas emission to produce ethanol. We can see here uh, in all those situations that uh, uh, fertilizers contribute uh, 46 to 59% of the total greenhouse gas emission uh, to produce ethanol. And this includes all field operations, uh, production of the fertilizer in the industry, uh, industrial process, uh, et cetera. So uh, the contribution of uh, fertilizers is very uh, important. And we can see here that when we use local data instead of the IPCC value, the uh, amounts of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitters are much lower. And especially here, uh, the emissions are decreased sharply here when we use uh, the fertilizer in the field, which is uh, where we uh, measure them. Here we have uh, the greenhouse gas emissions expressed in terms of CO2 equivalent for the whole uh, biorefinery producing 339 million liters uh, per year. Uh, using the IPCC default value, these emissions are uh, 163 gigagrams of CO2 equivalent, uh, and they decrease to 131, 128, 127 when uh, we use uh, local data and mitigation uh, strategies. I'd like you to compare this number, 163 gigagrams of CO2 equivalent, uh, with this number here uh, for gasoline. This is the emission of gasoline with the energy equivalent to the 300, 339 uh, million liters uh, produced in the biorefinery. So it's in, instead of the ethanol, we use gasoline. The emissions would be equivalent to 60, uh, 662 uh, gigagrams of CO2 equivalent. Therefore, uh, when we use ethanol, we have at least 75% uh, avoided uh, emission. Uh, and uh, these avoided emissions increases to 80% and 81% when we use uh, tier uh, two or the uh, 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 nitrification inhibitors and separation of, of uh, VNAS. Therefore, there's a large uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions when we use ethanol and uh, these emissions will decrease even further when using this other technique. Well, here in the right hand side, uh, we have the amounts of CBIOS that would be generated uh, by replacing uh, gasoline. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, the use of IPCC uh, default value, uh, this, this sugar, this biorefinery uh, would earn for 196,000 CBIOS, which are worth uh, approximately $5 million uh, by uh, the uh, avoided emissions. Uh, when uh, we computed uh, the local data, if we use uh, local data instead of the IPCC default value, 
in addition to this five million uh, US dollars, the mill would uh, earn uh, an extra 314 thousand uh, dollars which would increase to 245,362 uh, uh, dollars uh, if we adopt uh, nitrification inhibitors and the separation of uh, nitrogen fertilizer and vinas in the field therefore uh, there are uh, economic consequences of uh, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions but here uh, let's see uh, the, the consequences uh, using tier one or uh, the scenario one, uh, the meal uh, would earn up, uh, approximately one hundred dollars U.S. dollars per hectare, or, or three point uh, seven percent uh, addition uh, of the gross uh, gross revenue by selling ethanol to forty cents of a dollar per liter. If instead of uh, the IPCC number, we use uh, local uh, emission factors, the mill would earn an extra 314,000 uh, US dollars of uh, uh, by uh, extra sebios, which was worth about uh, 0.23% increase uh, over the gross revenue of tier one. Nitrification inhibitors would uh, earn an extra uh, Thirty-one thousand uh, dollars, and this would be equivalent to almost seven dollars per ton of nitrogen uh, used in the field. Probably, this extra uh, earning by using nitrification inhibitor would not be enough to pay for the nitrification inhibitor. The, the, this, uh, the extra uh, money is relatively low. Uh, when uh, we use this uh, strategy of separating the NAS and nitrogen fertilizer uh, in the field, it would be an extra 47,000 uh, US dollars uh, earned by uh, SFBio by uh, the ethanol plant. Probably this will be worse because the, the operating costs of uh, separating both inputs is relatively small. So summarizing and concluding, the current ethanol production system used in Brazil is uh, already highly efficient and reduces greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 73 to 75% compared with gasoline. And using local data, uh, these emissions will uh, decrease further by uh, approximately 19% and using nitrification inhibitor and vinas and fertilizer management practices would reduce it to 20, 21% therefore there's a uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emission by all of these uh, options. Uh, tier two, concluding tier two, may best reflect the greenhouse gas emission under Brazilian conditions. And this, uh, if we adopt this, uh, the bioenergy producers will earn uh, sizable amounts of extra bios. Other mitigation strategies decrease greenhouse gas emissions, but yield uh, relatively little economic gains compared to uh, the scenario one and scenario two. So that's what we have uh, had to present, and thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Lorenzo De Lucia, and I'm a research fellow at the Center for Environmental Policy at uh, Imperial College in London. I am uh, very happy to be here with you today and to share with you some of the lessons we learned and insights we gained uh, while working on landscapes and bioenergy systems. So my presentation today is titled Designing uh, Biofuel Landscapes for Sustainable Outcome. So the starting point uh, I would like to uh, stress with you is uh, bioenergy. We all know it's clearly connected with uh, many of the components of society, the environmental, socioeconomic components, and the interactions, they generate uh, impacts and both synergies and but also trade-offs. Uh, the generation of these impacts is dependent on a very complex system. Uh, we have a multitude of uh, effects, both ecological, social, economic, uh, we have tipping points, feedbacks, delays, uh, making sure that the final the outcome of integrating bioenergy in current systems is positive is a very, very difficult challenge. So what has been suggested is to use a landscape approach to facilitate this process. 
So a landscape is made of different ecological, geophysical, but also sociocultural, economic elements that characterize a place. Um, and the advantage of uh, using a landscape approach is that we can contextualize the analysis. So we can contextualize problems, values, norms, uh, and integrate social sciences with natural sciences and local knowledge. So these are the advantages of a landscape approach. Um, a specific type of a landscape approach is uh, the design, the landscape design. And it's basically the idea of uh, explicitly changing the patterns of a landscape to be able to provide more ecosystem services and meet a social, social needs and social values. Uh, this is very attractive and it uh, has been discussed in the literature um, and it could be used. It seems applicable to uh, guide uh, the development of bioenergy projects towards uh, what has been defined as multifunctionality. However, uh, the practical application of a, a landscape design approach towards uh, multifunctionality is not so straightforward. So we, we tried it out and we want to share with you uh, what we learned. We start from the conceptual model of a, a landscape design. Um, so we identified uh, key, key steps. So we have five steps uh, in the process. We identify the, the system, so basically the landscape, where our analysis will be conducted. Uh, we identify the stakeholders that are connected to the system and their values and concerns. And then together with stakeholders, we will develop uh, knowledge that will then be used in the decision-making process. The final step is to monitor the implementation of the decisions and to restart the process uh, whenever needed. So I'm going to use a, a practical case study to, to illustrate uh, the application of the approach. I'm using a case study from Italy, from the island of Sardinia, where we looked at uh, a cellulosic ethanol production plant, uh, a rather big one, uh, 80,000 tons of ethanol produced from 400,000 tons of biomass. Um, in this case, the feedstock as selected by the company was energy crops, and agricultural residues. And I'm gonna focus specifically on the energy crop, the giant reed in this case, for the rest of the presentation. So the first step in applying the uh, landscape design approach would be to define, to identify the location. So we knew where the plant was gonna be located. We knew some features of the uh, supply chain. Some land had to be converted to giant reed, which would have to be collected and transported for a maximum distance of 75 kilometers from the plant. So this gave us the initial uh, location of the landscape. But this was not enough. We needed to look into uh, the stakeholders and the values and concerns of those connected to the area. So uh, local stakeholders were those either benefiting from the ecosystem services in the area or in charge of managing the ecosystem services there. We identified 10 key groups of stakeholders, and you can see them on the table here, and analyzed their position by conducting personal interviews with each uh, representative. When we look at the results very briefly, uh, we can see in red the threats, what they perceive as threats, and in green what they perceive as opportunities. Clearly, among the most important threats, there is a uh, water availability. Sardinia is a semi-dry region, so it would be potentially problematic to irrigate the giant reed. Uh, competition uh, for, with local uh, food and animal feed production. Sardinia is an agricultural region, therefore there were concerns in this sense, and partly biodiversity. Clear opportunities are in the field of economic, uh, employment, and income generation but also a reduction of climate changing emissions and production of energy. So we use this knowledge to redefine or clarify the definition of the uh, landscape, the location, and we moved from uh, integrated the supply chain approach with uh, the ecosystem service approach and uh, identified a watershed as a reference area. Um, 
specifically because of the concerns with water availability. However, it emerged that some stakeholders were also concerned with impacts outside this uh, watershed area. So potentially by displacing productive activities from directly with the cultivation of a giant reed, we could affect the area uh, outside in the rest of the island or areas uh, outside the island. So we included this in the analysis as well. So throughout the process, we have uh, included, we have managed to engage stakeholders and this is a key component of the approach not only in the evaluation of uh, values and concerns, but also in the development of knowledge uh, through participatory modeling and the development of scenarios and in the decision-making processes where uh, stakeholders played a, a key role as decision makers. In the next step of knowledge development, we uh, worked to uh, quantify uh, potential impacts of the bioenergy project uh, and specifically trade-offs and synergies. Uh, we applied the ecosystem service framework and developed an integrated model uh, by coupling uh, independent models, as you can see there on the table. Um, so reviewing the literature and the stakeholder analysis that we presented earlier, uh, we developed a scoping model able to cover all the issues mentioned by the stakeholders. And this model was then refined uh, with experts and validated with the stakeholders. So here again, participation had a, an important role. Briefly on the results of the analysis of trade-offs and synergies, we have uh, mainly positive impacts, as you can see in the table, but also some trade-offs, specifically as expected on water availability, food production and animal feed production. We were able to identify the time of the year when uh, trade-offs and water availability would appear and also on which scenarios they would be more significant than others. Um, food production would be due to competition for land and this was uh, clearly connected with the uh, clearly emerging from the, the, the land use uh, assessment. We identified potential competition uh, for land with the sheep farming sector. Uh, so additional demand for land uh, for uh, giant tree production would enter in competition under certain conditions with uh, sheep farming. And uh, this would mean that some sheep farming activities would be displaced to the rest of the island. These are the results and uh, the, there is actually a possibility there. Uh, we don't say how likely it is, but we say what would happen in case. And we can see that the main determinants are uh, um, whether the, the feedstock is irrigated or rain fed, with irrigation more efficient in terms of land, but on the other side, it has a, a trade-off with water uh, use and the future demand for uh, ship cheese. That's also, that's the other big determinant. Uh, so if the demand reduces in the, is reduced in the future, the uh, indirect land use changes will disappear, as you can see in the last row of the figure. Um, and another conclusion was that the impacts will not move outside the island. There will be indirect land use changes potentially associated with the project, but they will not uh, exceed the, the borders of the island. All the knowledge that we collected and developed was then used uh, in a decision-making exercise. We gathered uh, representatives of all the stakeholder groups that we identified. Uh, we presented the results. Many of them were aware of the results because they participated in the uh, development of the models and results. We engaged a, a professional uh, facilitator uh, to uh, facilitate the conversation and the discussions among the stakeholders. And the discussions focused specifically on uh, the alternative scenarios. So what were the pros and cons from their perspective on the different scenarios? The ultimate goal was to reach a formal agreement on uh, the project, but we couldn't. Um, 
it became evident that there was agreement on uh, next steps and a common path uh, for the project, uh, specifically by integrating different elements of the uh, various uh, scenarios that we presented, um, but there was no formal agreement. On the other side, many of the stakeholders who were uh, in high disagreement before and very skeptical managed to have a, a conversation, a constructive conversation uh, during the event. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, the landscape approach was, uh, we don't know whether it was effective in achieving environmental and social benefits. The main reason is that the, the bioenergy project was not implemented in the end, it was suspended and it's not implemented uh, as today. Um, even though we need to say that uh, even if it was implemented, we would not have had the resources to monitor the, uh, the, the implementation of the project. This would have required several years of uh, monitoring activities, which is part of the methodology, but it's as of and very often this is a problem uh, with research projects. Uh, on the other side, it was effective in facilitating dialogue and a level of agreement among stakeholders. As I said before, the, uh, the, agreed, the stakeholders had uh, a common knowledge to use as a base for discussions, and that was very effective in focusing the discussion and avoiding uh, misuse of uh, knowledge. There are some challenges in applying this kind of approach to develop uh, bioenergy projects. Uh, primarily, it was the kind of amount of time and resources needed to conduct analysis. Uh, the team that uh, is needed to conduct this type of analysis is, uh, is very broad, from social to natural scientists and engagement experts. Um, another issue is certainly uh, the long-term monitoring uh, required. To, uh, to complement the process and to understand whether it's uh, effective in achieving the results. So this was all for me. I thank you for your attention and I welcome your questions.